Well, it's officially 40 after, uh, but I have this policy, which I, I like to wait for, uh, you know, the minute and 59 seconds. That way I can start on time, but that person that walks in at the last minute can still be on time. And usually when I say that, someone walks in at the last minute, but uh, I don't see anyone in. Uh, there, there you are. Thank you for walking in at the last minute. <laughs> Thank you for being voluntold to be the butt of my joke. So <laughs> how's everyone doing today? Yeah, did you learn lots and lots and lots of crap that you hope to get to use someday? <laughs> Welcome to another talk where you learn lots and lots of stuff that you hope to get to use. Uh, I, 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 this, this joke is going to be apropos of nothing to do with my talk, but it's a fun joke that I like to start con talks out with sometimes. I haven't used it in a couple years, uh, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a simple joke. What is a pirate's favorite programming language? I, you might think it'd be R matey, but his first love be the C. <laughs> that, that was actually a joke that my son told me when he was like eight years old. It's like, what's a pirate's favorite letter of the alphabet? <laughs> and he told me that, and I'm like, you know, those are both programming languages. <laughs> Geek dad. So, so welcome, everyone, uh, to Dungeons, Dragons, and Graph Databases. My name is Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate at Redis. Uh, there are three things on this slide that uh, matter. One of them matters to my boss. Right there. One of them matters to me. That'd be the Twitter account. And one of them matters to you, which is the GitHub URL. Uh, the GitHub URL uh, matters because I have sample code and the slides and all that stuff, and it's all out on GitHub under at github.com slash guyrice. So those are the three things that matter on that slide. There's the logo. Follow me on Twitter, please. And hey, here's code that you can actually play with, the, use to play with this stuff. So uh, I'm a developer advocate. This means what I'm doing right now is part of my job, which honestly is kind of a kick-ass job. Um, but in addition to being a developer advocate, I uh, play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. I, I know that might come as a shock. I totally don't look like, sh like I should be playing Dungeons and Dragons. I totally look like I should be running the game. <laughs> I do that too. Um, but so I thought I'd include my character sheet here. There's a bunch of details on here, but the only thing that really matters is down here in the bottom right corner, my ability scores. See, so I've got an intelligence of eight and a wisdom of eight and a charisma of 16. And that tells you everything you need to know about this talk. It's going to be all sizzle, no steak. <laughs> um, and uh, as a player of Dungeons and Dragons, I have a problem. You know, I need to level up my character so I can take on bigger challenges and defeat bigger and more powerful monsters, get better treasure to buy better gear, and the cycle repeats. And the only place to do that is a dungeon. You got to go to the dungeon to kill the monsters. So you need to find the rooms in the dungeons that are the best rooms to explore. You've got to find the best monsters that are the appropriate challenge that I can overcome them and max my experience, but not so much that we have a TPK. And, of course, you need to find the rooms that have all the gold. And so this is a problem. All of us gamers have this problem. Um, and, but since I'm also a developer, I thought, well, I could build a database. I could put all the rooms and all the monsters and all the treasure in the database, and I could query it. And I could figure out which rooms I could go to first. I could optimize my gaming experience. And of course, my first thought was, I could use a relational database. Right? That, that's like your default. What kind of database do we need? Eh, probably a relational one. But um, there's another cool kind of database called a graph database. And so we could use a graph database. And so what we're going to do is we're going to explore uh, what it would look like to solve this problem with a relational database, with SQL. How many people here know SQL? That should be everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, how many people here uh, have used graph databases before? Probably a couple of you. A few, yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to use a graph database. So I'll, I'll compare and contrast these. And so the first question that a lot of you probably have is, what the heck's a graph database? Uh, I, I can tell you one thing it's not. This, this comes up a lot. Is people hear graph, and they think it's GraphQL. A uh, graph database is not GraphQL, although it plays nicely with a graph database because they're using the same metaphor. Graph database is a database. It's a database. It's a way of storing things, not a way of querying things. Of course, you do need to query your databases, so that's going to come up. But the, the question before this is really, you know, before I can answer what's a graph database, I have to ask, what's a graph? Now, many of you have probably taken math and done some graph theory. Uh, I have not. 
So if you are one of those people, you know more than me, congratulations. Um, but we'll sort of give a five or 10 minute layman's introduction to graph theory, and then we'll go into graph databases. So a graph is, well, it's a series of nodes or vertices uh, connected by edges or relationships. Um, they can represent all sorts of things mathematically. This 20-sided uh, die right here is a graph. The points are the vertices, and the edges are, well, the edges. And so this graph, um, its main purpose in life would be to represent a platonic solid, a 20-sided die, roll for initiative. Um, and, uh, but they don't have to just be platonic solids. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be geometry. You can represent all sorts of things with a graph. Perhaps the simplest graph is really boring. <laughs> it's a null graph. That's a graph with no nodes, no edges. <coughs> and uh, some mathematicians debate whether a null graph is a real graph or not. Um, it's kind of like saying, is null and undefined the same thing in JavaScript? I don't know. Um, why do we have null and undefined in JavaScript anyhow? But uh, null graphs are, from a graph database point of view, an empty database, and so they're not very interesting. So we're not going to talk about it anymore. Let's put some uh, nodes to our graph. So now we've got a uh, simple graph. This is technically a graph. Uh, there's no relationships here. There's no edges connecting these nodes, but they're just kind of points floating out in space. So we've got a collection of nodes. We don't know a lot about them. Uh, it's almost like a set. Like you could represent a set using a graph without relationships. Probably not the most efficient way to do it, but you could do it. And this is perfectly valid. You do not have to have relationships in a graph for it to be a graph. It's not a very useful graph. So let's add some relationships. So now our graph is growing a little bit. It's got some, uh, we can see that node E is hanging out there by itself. Nodes A, C, G, and D are sort of clustered there to in the middle together. And B and F are best friends forever there in the bottom right corner. And so this is kind of looking like what you would think of when you think of a graph. Portions of this graph are isolated. So E is out there all by its lonesome. It's not connected to anything. It's an isolated subgraph. B and F are also an isolated subgraph because they're not connected to the larger graph. And in fact, the big part of the graph in the middle is also isolated from all the other parts in the graph. So we can refer to parts of a graph as being isolated if they're not connected to other parts of the graph. If they're just little islands. If uh, no, no part of your graph is isolated, like this graph here, if every node is connected by way of another node to another node, then it's considered to be connected. So we have an isolated subgraphs. This is a connected graph. Every node has a path to any other node. Not directly, necessarily, but there's a path. So D connects to C by way of A or A and B. So connected graphs. Uh, a fully connected graph is uh, when every node connects to every node. And uh, this little subgraph here, A, B, and C, they're fully connected because A connects to all the other nodes in the graph. This, um, this is be best described by a network diagram. You've ever seen that, that, that circle with all the nodes in a network and you get cords going across it to make it like a, you know, a star and everything connects? That is a fully connected graph. We've, s we've seen these before. Um, I just did this one because it looks prettier with the rest of my slides. <laughs> so a fully connected graph is where all the nodes are connected. These graphs that I've been showing you are undirected. An undirected graph is where the relationships don't, well, they, they don't have a direction. Um, a is connected to B, B is connected to A, they're related, the, there's, a vertic, vertic, there's a vertex connecting them, but uh, there's no sense of, I don't know any other word than direction to describe directionality. <laughs> um, but there's no additional information. You can make graphs be directed, and that gives extra information in the relationship. So now we know that A is connected to B, and it's in, it has a natural direction. In the case of an undirected graph, that might be like friends on Facebook. Like if you, were on, you and I are friends on Facebook, because we are, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, then um, that's a mutual thing, and so it's an undirected relationship. Uh, but um, if I follow you on Twitter and you don't follow me back, that's a directed relationship. Uh, another example might be uh, my, my siblings. 
they're all my siblings. There's, there's not a direction to that relationship. It's just my sister is my sister, and I'm her brother, and that's just an undirected relationship. But my mother, there's a natural direction to that relationship. My mother beget me. I did not beget her. Right? <laughs> and so, directed and undirected. When we're talking about these graphs, we can uh, talk about an idea of degrees. Uh, the nodes of a graph have degrees. A degree is simply the number of uh, edges it has coming in and out. So node A here has three relationships, three edges, three vertices, and so it has a degree of three. If we have a directed graph, it can have an out degree and an in degree, which is the number of relationships coming out and in, respectively. And probably the, uh, the, the, the most important thing is, is that there really aren't a lot of rules about how things connect in a graph. This is neat and tidy because it fits on a flat piece of paper. But it doesn't have to be two-dimensional. It doesn't care about dimensionality at all. Uh, anything can connect to anything. Nodes can connect more, more than once to each other with different properties. So here we've got uh, A and C connecting to each other mutually in a directed graph. A connects to itself. So you can connect these nodes and edges any way you want. There's no rules. You know, you're, 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 unlike Ghostbusters, you're allowed to cross the streams. <laughs> so that's my like five-minute graph theory, some total of all my knowledge. <laughs> uh, a graph database is then when you take uh, this graph model and you, you represent it digitally, and you lay data over top of it. So then the nodes become things that you care about. And then you can put data on those nodes. So these nodes represent rooms of a dungeon and properties on those rooms in the dungeon. And they represent the monsters of a dungeon and the, uh, the treasure in a dungeon. And so here we'll, like, we have uh, a monster, Alice the Elf, and another monster, Bob the Ogre. They've got properties. Fun fact, actually, my grandparents' names are Alice and Bob. <laughs> or, well, <laughs> were, I, I suppose. <laughs> uh, they've been gone a long time. Um, and so I, I suppose my grandmother was a bit elfin. Uh, my grandfather was certainly not an ogre. He was a very nice old man. Um, but I've always found it kind of funny that, you know, this sort of stereotypical, like the classic element. It's, the, oh, it's always Alice and Bob. I was like, I was using it for years, and I realized one day, oh, crap, that's, those are my grandparents' names. <laughs> but uh, so you add these, uh, these nodes now have properties. You can think of them as rows in a database almost. And then uh, the relationships uh, can have... Uh, types on them to tell you what type they are, and it can also have properties. So you lay data on top of this graph structure, and you get yourself a database worthy of Mordor. Couple notes um, about nodes and, and relationships. The nodes in a graph uh, represent items. I tend to use them for nouns, and uh, the relationships uh, represent those connections between those nodes. I tend to use those for verbs. And so, uh, the nodes can have a label for what they are. They can have more than one label. So it could be a room, but you could also have like a chamber or a corridor, what might be a, you know, a type of room. And they could be both of those things. And they can have art attributes with strings and booleans and numbers and stuff in them. And a node can just stand by itself. It doesn't need relationships to exist. It can just be out there and you can query it. Uh, and a node can certainly be an island. It can be isolated. Uh, the relationships are a connection between two nodes. They have a type as opposed to a label. They can only have one type. If you want to have a different type of relationship, you create a second relationship. Uh, they have a direction, and they can have attributes as well. As well. So like uh, leads to might have a, an attribute of distance. If you were doing some sort of pathing algorithm to find the best path through a dungeon, knowing the distance might be useful because you could find the shorter path based on the, the weight or the, the distance that's represented in that, that edge. And, uh, and this is important if you're uh, using a graph database. The relationships cannot exist without a node. So if you remove a node from your graph, the relationships go away. They are deleted automatically. Um, so if you've got data in there that you care about, no, you don't. <laughs> I find that if I'm doing it right, it reads like a sentence, where you've got a direct object or a, a, a subject a transitive verb, and a direct object. So the room contains a monster. So I've got a room node, got a contains relationship to a monster node. So thank you for attending my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs>
That's all the theory and just the concepts around this. Uh, let's get into the real meat of how to do this. Because we've, st we've still got a problem. Well, I've got a problem anyhow. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I want to optimize my uh, dungeon runs, my dungeon crawls. And um, I haven't decided how I'm going to solve it yet. Am I going to use a relational database with the tables and the columns and the rows and the, and the, uh, the foreign keys? Or am I going to use a graph database with the nodes and the relationships? Spoiler alert, it's going to be graph. <laughs> And so uh, when we go to talk to a relational database, we use SQL or SQL. W which one's the right one? Quick show of hands. Is it SQL? SQL. Excellent. I get to be right both ways. <laughs> so <laughs> is it GIF or JIF? No. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. But now I'm going to get all the red cards. Yeah. <laughs> So when we talk to a relational database, we use SQL. Uh, we, we all know SQL. It's, it's the only language that I learned in college back in the early 90s that I still use on occasion. Don't use any others. I still use SQL. Uh, and where you're selecting from the tables, you're joining on foreign keys, getting the fields back, filtering with a where clause, right? We all know this stuff. We've all used this a lot in our career. The equivalent or an equivalent for graph databases, and the graph database uh, we're looking at today is going to be Redis Graph. Uh, Redis Graph uses Cypher. And Cypher uses this matching syntax to find things. And uh, it's actually kind of cool, because if you look at it, it's kind of like ASCII art. It looks like, a, the, the, right? it looks like the graph that I want to query, that, that I want to match against. And the matchers is really kind of the cool part. If we, we zoom in on that, we've got this, the room contains a monster. Right? That matches a room node. Colon room means match any node in the graph that has a label of room. The R means assign it to the variable R, so I can use it later in my query. The parentheses make it a node. And so it's like round. Right? It's like I, it's like I drew a circle around it. Same thing for monster here. This finds any uh, node in the graph with a label of monster and assigns it to the variable m. And then in the middle here, we have a relationship that matches any, um, any relationship with a type of contains. And you'll notice right there that there's an arrow on it. So we actually, oh, hang on, there we go. All right, you got that little arrow right there. It's actually a line with a label on it. So you've got like circles and lines connecting them together. So it looks kind of like the thing that we want to query which I think is kind of neat. Uh, and this is at the heart of it. And so this says, find any room that contains a monster. Match that pattern in the entire graph. You can imagine that if you have a really big graph and really poor queries, this could be slow. <laughs> you, you, can, you can optimize that. Don't worry. Um, so to explore um, uh, Cypher a little bit uh, deeper, I'm going to go through our classic CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete. And I'm going to show how we would do this in SQL, which we should all know already. And if you don't know, that's OK. I didn't know once, too. And I'm going to show how we could do the same thing with Cypher. And this is going to just create nodes. We're not going to do relationships yet. We'll do that in, in, a, in a bit. So if we want to insert into a room, A, we need to have a room table created already. And so we're assuming we have a room table. And we say insert into room with our field names and then the values for those fields. To do it with Cypher, we call create. And we give it a pattern. And this pattern defines that node. So we're saying create a node with a label of room. Assign it to variable R for our use later. And then we call set. And then we start setting properties on that node. Now, uh, one thing that's very important to note here is, is that in the SQL, our ID and name are baked into the table, right? We have a schema. The graph node does not have a schema. And so we've decided that we want to have two properties on here. But we could add any properties we want, now or later. So we create it, and we set a couple properties, but it's schemaless. So we can change our minds, do what we want, make a mess if we want. So this is the create syntax. It's fairly straightforward. To read our room with SQL, this is the first thing we learn. 
Select star from users where clue greater than zero. <laughs> to query a graph database, we use the match keyword. We'll say match r colon room. Again, that matches all nodes that are of type room with, with a label of room, assigns those to the variable r. We add a where clause to filter them out. So where the ID is one. And we return it. So far, so good. When it's time to update a room, we use an update statement in SQL, which I've always thought was kind of, uh, I've always thought these were kind of heavy. Like you gotta set your individual fields and everything, it's kind of weird. Um, I suppose you have to always just specify the fields you wanna set, but so update room, set name equals statue hall. The statue room is getting more statues, it's getting an upgrade. My, uh, my grandma will be pleased. To do this in Cypher, I think this is actually pretty interesting because in the previous one we were saying match room where ID. We're doing that again, but in the query we returned it, and in here we're going to set properties on it. So whereas before it was match room where ID equals one, return, this is match room where ID, and then start setting properties on it. Um, what's kind of neat here too is that because there's no schema, we could add properties later. So if their property wasn't there, we could add a new property as well, which would be very hard to do with a relational database just because it's schemaless. And so here we're setting the name to statue hall. We could also say like r dot is trapped equals true or something like that, whatever we want to do. And then to delete a room, deletion is my favorite command. <laughs> uh, we can delete from rooms where ID is equal to one. We've all done this. Make sure you put that where ID equals one or you're gonna have a bad day. <laughs> and maybe be updating your resume. <laughs> to do this in Cypher, it's the same again. It's match where, and then instead of returning, or in instead of setting properties, we just delete the node. And if there's any relationships, those relationships go away with it. So we're at that, uh, that point of the, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of learning where we think we know things, but we don't know them as well as we think we know them. I'm like, this is easy. I could do this. I'm ready to use this now. No, you know, wait, there's more. <laughs> it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. That was the word I was looking for. Um, there's an, I want to make a note here on the syntax. I've been doing that uh, match where, but you can actually, um, I, I've been using the syntax where match room where ID equals whatever. You can also embed that into the match. So uh, this is a, a little more of a concise syntax. You're saying match the pattern of a room where the ID is one, where it's got a property of one. And you could put multiple properties on there. So you could say, I want all rooms to have an ID of one and a name of, you know, um, statue hall. Uh, and there, it's in, inside those curly braces, it's just like, a, it's Java syntax, or JavaScript syntax. It's just key colon value, comma key colon value, comma key colon value. If it's a Boolean, you use true or false. If it's a number, you just use a number. If it's a string, you put it in quotes. So it's a familiar syntax. But this is a, a more convenient way to match things sometimes. And this works with create as well, where here I'm creating a room, and then I'm setting properties on the room after I create it. I can also just create a room with the curly braces and the properties I want. And you'll notice that I don't assign room to a variable here. I just do colon room. And that's not a typo. That's because I don't need to refer to the room because I've created it and I'm done. So there's some other syntax you can use here to make this a little more terse. And you can see this here when we go to create monsters. I'm creating a monster in the bottom right there. I don't assign monster to M and I just give all the properties. And uh, when I'm creating treasure, here you can see that you can mix and match these. So you can create a node with properties, assign it to a variable, and then add even more properties if you want to live your life that way. So, so far, our relational database, we've got three tables, they've got some properties, they've got some rows in them. We've got three rooms in our graph, or in, in our dungeon, we've got two treasures, two monsters. Our graph is just a bunch of nodes floating out there in space. They're not related to each other at all, other than by the fact that they have a, a label of room or a label of monster or a label of treasure. So, 
the next interesting thing that we need to do is we need to put a monster in a room. So how do we do this with a relational database? Foreign key. So we have to alter our table and then update that table to put those monsters in a room. So now Alice the Elf is in room one, which is the statue room, which was recently upgraded to the statue hall. And Bob the Ogre, uh, Grandpa, is in the armory. This makes sense to me. <laughs> um, so in a relational database, we'd have to alter our schema and then make some updates. How do we put a monster in a room with a graph database? Well, we need to create a relationship. And to do that, we need to match a couple of nodes. So here we're matching a room with an ID of one, monster with an ID of four. So this gets uh, uh, the, uh, the statue hall and uh, Alice the elf. And then uh, we call create. And we can reference those variables we used earlier without creating them and then define the relationship between them. Say create a contains relationship between them. So this will then put that monster in a room. It'll create a relationship where the, the room contains a monster. Putting treasure in a room is the same deal. I'm a little bit of a completionist and I could not make these slides. So. But it's the same deal. We're doing a foreign key. We're updating the relationship. And so now our relational database is, uh, it's, this is a really common pattern with the relational database, right? We've got, uh, we've got a root table uh, with a one-to-many relationship to rooms, uh, to monsters and treasures. Our graph uh, is starting to look a little more graphy. Uh, the rooms now contain things. They have contains relationships. You've still got these nodes kind of floating out there, but there's a few relationships connecting them together. And we actually have enough that we can uh, do some interesting queries. So I say it's munchkin time. Anyone play Munchkin? Everyone. It should be everyone. Come on. <laughs> We're going to loot the room. Yeah. <laughs> or look for trouble, one or the other. Uh, so um, we can query what rooms have monsters and what rooms have treasure in a useful way. And if we were to do this, say, to farm all the XP, I want to find the room that's got the biggest monster or get a list of monsters by experience points. To do that with a relational database, we do a basic join. So select from a couple tables where the IDs match and order descending. To do that with uh, a graph database using Cypher, we need to match a pattern, a pattern of the room contains a monster. So every room that contains a monster is going to give us a row of results. And then we're going to return the ID, the name, and the experience points for those rows. If a room does not contain a monster, it's not going to return anything. If a room contains only a treasure, it won't return anything. If it contains more than one monster, we'll get multiple. The same room will be there multiple times. <coughs> and then we're just going to order it uh, descending by the experience points. So the, the biggest experience points flow through the top. So this is actually doing exactly the same thing that we're doing with the relational database. So far, we haven't done anything with graph that we can't do with SQL and vice versa. We can do the same thing to get all the gold. Uh, it's th the same basic join, but we want to find the room that has the most gold. And here we're going to find rooms that contain treasure. We don't know if they have monsters or not, but they can contain treasure. We could query rooms that contain both monsters and treasure by sticking some uh, stuff on the other side of that, uh, that, that query. So we have an arrow pointing back the other day way. Um, but here we're just doing treasures. And this is the same query as before, just with treasures instead of monsters. So this is kind of cool, but so what? This is just like relational databases with extra steps, right? Well, it gets interesting when you start connecting your rooms together. And this is where graph databases start really differentiating from a relational database. How would we connect a room to a room in a relational database? How would we connect a room to a room in a graph database? In a relational database, we need to create a new table. And that table is going to have IDs for the room that's going from and to. So we insert into that table uh, that, hey, uh, you know, row two in that table says that uh, room one, the statue room, leads to room two, the barracks. 
and then this table gets really big. And querying this table gets kind of hairy because you're because it's recursive, right? There's ways to do it. I always forget the name of the way to do this in, 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 in I think, in SQL Server. Uh, I know there's a word for it. I always forget the name of it. And then someone in the audience always reminds me. <laughs> yeah, CTEs. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so you can use CTEs to do this. I haven't used them. I hear they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> so I don't want to. Um, but you can do that. So this is how you would model this. What you're really doing here, actually, is you're modeling the graph using a relational database. Because you're saying, well, this is a node, and this is how they connect. Connecting rooms and graph is familiar. Because instead of connecting a room to a monster, a room contains a monster, or a room contains a treasure, we just say a room leads to another room. And so we match room one, we match room two, and then we create the relationship between them. Because the relationship between the rooms is exactly the same in its nature as the relationship from any node to any node. And so this allows us to create a, a very uh, natural sort of semantic structure. It, it matches how you think about the problem. This room just connects to this room. Whereas with a you know, relational database that, that you've got this table, it's hard to reason about. And so our graph database here, for this relatively small problem, our relational database here, uh, is um, gotten kind of complicated. Um, this uh, big blue connections table over here is going to get big. Our graph database kind of looks like what it is. I mean, I put this over top of a map of a dungeon on purpose because it kind of looks like a dungeon. You can look at it and get a sense of, it's like a subway map, right? Um, and so I think it's a tidier way to represent these sorts of problems. And uh, with our graph database here, we should be able to do some interesting queries. Uh, but I just, I just remembered an aside. So I did the same talk um, a couple months ago at NDC London, and they put a video up, uh, of it up on YouTube. And the guy who did the, uh, the, the map that I'm using in the background, uh, Dyson Logos, he watched the video and tweeted at me. <laughs> it was the coolest thing ever. I've been look, consuming his maps for like five years, and it was just kind of a fun moment. Um, so if you're watching Dyson, thanks for all the awesome maps. <laughs> So we can do some more interesting queries now that we have these rooms connected to rooms. Um, and so we're going to do some of these. Uh, and one of the syntaxes that allow us to do the interesting queries is these variable length relationships. So we've got a match down here. It's got a little star there. We haven't seen the little star before. What does the little star mean? Well, this matches a room, and that matches a room, matches a couple nodes. The star says, match multiple hops. And so this would match a room that leads to a room, or a room that leads to a room that leads to a room, or a room that leads to 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 a room to you guys leave when I say that too many times. And so uh, it can match multiple paths. Now, if you just do a query and match this and return it against a graph, that's going to be a lot of paths. Right? <laughs> so, so don't do that. That's a good way to get a timeout. Um, but this is a query that you can do. And you can also give it some limits. So here uh, we're saying it needs to be at least one hop away, but not more than three. So this would match a, you know, a room that leads to a room, 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 but no more. Um, and so you can put boundaries around it. And so this lets us build interesting queries like, hey, uh, I'm in the dungeon, I'm in a room, what are some nearby rooms that I could go to? Well, we could say, I, assuming I'm in room number one, I could match room one leads to one or two rooms away, another room. And then I could return the ID and name of those rooms that are nearby. So this finds nearby rooms. This would be kind of like uh, if you were doing Facebook, you could do a query and say, give me a list of all the people that are the friend, my friends and their friends which you can guarantee Facebook does. <laughs> it's that sort of query. That could be useful. Let's add a little bit more to it. Let's find the nearby room with the most gold. So here we have a little more complex of a query. We've got a room that we're in, leads to one or two hops away. That room must contain treasure. We'll return the uh, name of that room and the ID 
and the gold piece value of that treasure. Order that descending, so the most expensive, the biggest item goes to the top, and then limit it to one. Now I know which room I want to go to next. The room that's two hops away or one hop away with the most gold. Nearby, because I'm lazy. Valuable, because I want to be rich. Uh, you could query the longest path through the dungeon. You want to hit every room? This query will do that. And the way it does it is it does that room leads to a room with a star, so it finds all the paths in that graph, every single one of them, every room to every room, and all the paths that can get to that room, not just the shortest path, all of them. And uh, here we assign that to the variable p in our match. That's the path. Once we have that path, we can ask questions of it. So here we're going to find all the rooms and all the paths to all the rooms, assign it to p, and then we'll return the nodes that are in that path and the uh, length of that path in hops. And then we can order that by that length descending, limit one, and that'll give us the longest path between any room to any room. Should give us the longest path through the dungeon. Sort of the traveling salesman problem for Dungeons and Dragons aficionados. <laughs> uh, we can do the room with the biggest treasure. Here's some other syntax. Here, uh, we're using a, um, a, a grouping function here. Uh, so we're going to match all the treasure nodes. And then we're going to take those treasure nodes and say max of a particular value on that node. So this is going to get the, the most valuable, the, the value of the biggest treasure in the entire dungeon. And we're going to give it a name of max GP. Then we can look for all the rooms that contain treasure where the gold piece value is equal to that max gold piece value. So this will find the room with the biggest treasure. Or if the, there's two the ties, it'll give you two rooms back. And then we return them. And you can actually combine all of these together. So here we're matching for treasure and getting the max gold piece value. And then we use that to match the room that would contain it, make that the destination. And then we get the path from the room we're in to the room we want to go to, which is the destination. Then we get the nodes, the length, and uh, we get the length, the nodes in that path, the length of that path, and sort it by length ascending, which will give us the shortest path to the room with the most gold. Now, this is not the most efficient way to do this, because it ends up having to query every path in the dungeon to get there. There's actually a shortest path algorithm that we can use instead. So this does a very similar thing, uh, but instead of just filtering our data, we're actually going to call a shortest path algorithm in uh, Redis Graph to say, fr from start to stop, give me the shortest path there. And this runs about an order of magnitude faster. Cool? I hope the answer is yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to go back to America and cry. <laughs> now, let's demo this. I, th I think we've got time for a demo. I, I actually I blew through that a little quicker than I normally do, so that that's a, a good thing. <laughs> So I've got some demos here. Can we see my screen? I think we can. This is the war room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple little demos here. Uh, one thing I've done is I've, I've built a random dungeon generator. And uh, it will just generate a random dungeon and shove it into Redis Graph. I create random names and everything. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the code of the random dungeon generator because it's mostly about generating random names and random rooms and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it does write to Redis Graph whenever it makes these changes. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'll just do npm. Is my font big enough? Or do I need to hit Command Plus about five times? Everyone in the back read it? That's probably way too big, isn't it? <laughs> Screw it. Go big or go home, right? <laughs> if you ain't first, you're last. Shake and bake. Um, so I'm just going to do npm start. That's going to run server.js. It's done. I now have a generated dungeon. Isn't, th isn't that an impressive demo, everyone? <laughs> Yay! Uh, let's go ahead and look in the graph. So uh, I've got this tool here, Redis Insight, which is a little GUI for Redis. Uh, you can get it at, uh, I think I have a link to it in the end. It's redis.com slash Redis Insight, I think. Um, and I'm going to go to this little workbench here, and I'm going to query the graph database. So I'm going to say graph.query, 
And the, the, uh, the graph I created is slightly different from one of my slides. I have a dungeon node, which has a name for the whole dungeon, and it has entrances and exits, but then it has rooms and monsters and stuff. And the IDs work a little bit differently, but this will show that this stuff is real. So query dungeon, and we'll go into here. Uh, we'll, let's see, we'll say, we'll do uh, the, the select star dot star, the select star from query for graph first. And let me in dig in that a bit too. So I'm just saying match node, I don't care about its label, just match n, give me any node, give me all the nodes and return them. So this is like select star, this is just dump the entire graph out. And so this tool has a really cool uh, visual representation here. We can go for the text response here if we want. All right, it just shows you all the nodes. That's not nearly as cool, so we're gonna go with the, uh, the graphical response here and watch everything bounce around. Let's see if I can get that to, yeah. It's a little tight, but, so here we have a random monster. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that. <laughs> Jeanneth the Wraith. Six rays, and, if I, and the cool thing here with uh, this particular tool is if I double click on that, it should give me uh, all the relations. Let's find a room. Now here's the dungeon, the Forgotten Fortress of Olkirira. <laughs> but if I double click on that, this totally worked. Now normally if you double click on this, I think it's my trackpad. If you double click on it, it would show you all the nodes. This demo is totally failing. <laughs> let's, let's do this, let's match, let's match the dungeon. So that node is of type dungeon, there's only one of them. We say match D colon dungeon, return D. So there we go. There's the dungeon, the forgotten fortress. There we go. And so here's all the rooms, right? This, this is kind of cool. And there's the has entrance, has exit. Here's the damp hall. Uh, is there sev seven semi-precious stones, nine gems, no monsters. Maybe there's some monsters in the big chasm. I'm not seeing any. Wait, there's a monster. Three orcs, six wraiths. So we can sort of, using this tool, browse the graph somewhat awkwardly at this resolution. If we had a big monitor, it'd be really nice. Um, and you can also get just like the text out of it. And so some of these queries I was showing you earlier, we could, we could run here. I've got them in a little queries.txt here. So if I go down to like, um, let's go to shortest path to the most gold the hard way. This is that shortest path to the most gold without using the, uh, the function. I go up here, say graph.query dungeon. Ah, I did it wrong. Yeah, it's got indentation in it. I've changed the version that I, I've used to do this particular aspect of the demo here. And I have, I clearly, I didn't rehearse this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's add some spaces here. Put a quote there. Oh no, I've lost it all. Well, anyhow, <laughs> I've got a better idea. Let's do it from code. So I've got in here just a little demo that shows you how you can uh, query this using JavaScript. I use JavaScript because, because I hate myself. <laughs> It means I go home at night and I cry. Uh, so uh, here I'm just using Node Redis, which is uh, the the officially supported Redis client for uh, uh, for Node. Uh, I'm creating a client. I'm connecting, I'm handling any errors, and then I call client.graph.query. Give it the key name. My graph is in a key in Redis as dungeon, and then I give it a query. And so this is this simple query here is just going to match the dungeon, return Dia's name and the ID. And if I run this, we can see that we get very hard to read JSON out. So let's do this. 
the dash dash silent will get rid of the, the node demo.js stuff. And then I'm piping into a command line tool called JQ, which is kind of like said for, uh, for JavaScript for JSON, which is fantastic. Uh, it's a great tool. And the main thing it's being used to do here is make my output pretty. So here we got our dungeon name, the Forgotten Fortress of Olg Pirar. Uh, <laughs> if we run the uh, generation again and run this command again, we'll get another dungeon name, the Dim Caves of Bungo. <laughs> Let's do one more just for, just for just for the hell of it. One of these days I'm gonna get something that's just horribly inappropriate. <laughs> the fabled castle of Hergbog. I'm gonna use that in my next D&D game. <laughs> um, but what we can do is we can take some of these queries that I was showing you earlier and we can just swap them out here in the code. So we'll go to this query here, go into demo.js, because I'm using back ticks, that will work. So that ran in about 900 milliseconds, which isn't bad. It's slow by Reddit standards, but it's not bad. And um, this is the longest path through the dungeon. These are the nodes, and that is the length of that path. So there's three edges between those nodes. If we do the other query down here, which uses the shortest path algorithm, we should see a significant improvement. I actually haven't demoed that comparison live, so we're, you're gonna find out with me how much of an improvement it is. I know I said order of magnitude earlier in the talk. I may have been uh, making that up on the fly. <laughs> Let's run that. Eight milliseconds. Uh, it's uh, two orders of magnitude. I was totally making that up on the fly. <laughs> I, I meant to say I w didn't want to exaggerate, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so clearly that's a lot faster, right? And, uh, the, and it should have gotten me the same result. It actually gave me a different result, result for the longest path, through the shortest path through the dungeon. Um, oh, no, no, no. This is the, this is the, these are the nodes. These are the edges. Node, edge, node, edge. So. So they both, ha they both have the length of three. So it's the same path. So cool. That's the demo. Uh, it's <laughs> it actually works. It actually works. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get back to the slides. There we go. You all see that? I can't see the screens that you see. So, so this has been fun and kind of a impractical exercise, right? But there are actually practical applications for graph databases. I hinted at some earlier, uh, as uh, we are friends on Facebook, but you don't follow me on Twitter because I kn that's how you are. <laughs> Thank you for letting me pick on you, by the way. Um, practical applications, obviously social networks. Social graph is an obvious, super obvious application. Twitter, Facebook, you got a social graph, friends of friends of friends. You can query a graph database and say, well, give me all my friends of friends and then their friends, and then you can do like intersections of those sets and say, this is probably a friend that you should know. You probably know this person because you have these, all these people in common. Graph databases are excellent for that kind of stuff. Uh, genealogy. Uh, this is just social networks extruded over time. <laughs> right? um, you know, so you, you've got uh, parents and children and siblings and spouses and all that kind of stuff. That would be another natural um, problem to solve with a graph database. Uh, transportation networks. Uh, all of your intersections are e obvious nodes. Uh, your roads are the edges. Uh, bus stops, train stations, um, taxi pickups, those would all be part nodes on a transportation network, and then you could query that network and find the shortest path. You could weight those uh, edges based on traffic conditions and find the best path given the traffic conditions. And logistics networks. So if you want to figure out, uh, 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 I had a boss who liked to use the example of uh, poison spinach. It's like anti-Popeye. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, uh, where uh, you had, we had some problems in the US a few years ago with spinach that had been contaminated with E. coli. And it's like, well, uh, we figured out that it's in these stores where they bought it. And we could query the logistics network of the stores and the warehouses and the trucks and the farms and figure out which farms it could have come from. Um, 
you know, I suppose I don't have this example here, but of course, epidemiology is an obvious scenario for this as well. So, uh, but too soon. <laughs> so, so lots of practical applications. I actually think there's an even more application for uh, Redis Graph, which is honestly, it really would work for any database. Uh, you, a lot of your problems that you could solve with a relational database can be modeled neatly in a graph database, almost in a more, I, I shudder almost to say this, a, an object-oriented way. Like, object-oriented programming in my brain has always been programming around nouns, whereas like functional programming is programming around verbs, or procedural is programming around verbs. And this feels in a, in a way similar. It's like I could easily map all of my uh, graph entities to an object graph in memory. And so I feel like there's a good synergy there. So really, any problem, you could mod model like a policy system with a graph database, and you've got policy nodes, and you've got customer nodes, and you've got writer nodes, and just all the things that you would have like on an insurance policy. But if you want to play with these, any of these practical or impractical options with um, graph databases, the easiest way to do that is to use Redis Stack. Uh, Redis Stack is, well, it's just Redis. Um, but Redis with plugins. So uh, Redis has this capability to add modules to it. Uh, you can add JSON, Redis JSON, so you can have a JSON type. You can add search, so you can search those JSON documents. You can add graph databases, which is what we've been talking about today. So you can use Redis Graph uh, as part of Redis Stack. Uh, there's a time series mechanism in there as well. And uh, Redis Bloom adds probabilistic data structures. If anyone that was in Steve's talk the, uh, yesterday on probabilistic data structures, he was using Redis Bloom. You want to get Redis Stack? Go to redis.io slash docs slash stack, and there'll be a nice Docker command that you can copy and paste, and you'll be up and running before you know it. So, and um, while we're talking about all the paying the bills here, <laughs> I've been working for Redis for one die four minus one years. Uh, we have a Discord server. Uh, I'm often on it. Uh, many of my coworkers are on that as well. So if you are a Discord user, and you want to use these toys and play with them and do cool stuff, and you have questions, you can post them on Discord, discord.gg slash Redis. We've got about, I think we've got about 6,000 people on there now or so, or 7,000. It's, it's growing quite nicely. Um, the client I use to talk to Redis Graph and just to Redis in general is called Redis Insight. If you do Redis Stack, it comes automatically with it. Uh, you can install it separately at redis.com slash Redis Insight. And um, if you want to, uh, you don't want to install Redis on your machine, you just want to use a cloud thing, uh, there's free cloud instances out there at redis.com slash try free. And if you can use code stack 200, then you will get $200 in free credits, and my boss will know that you attended my talk. <laughs> uh, all the slides are up on GitHub. All the code is up on GitHub, so you can, you can QR code this link. It will never give you up nor let you down or take you to some site that it's not supposed to. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, shit. <laughs> Uh, that's my talk. I've actually got time for a couple questions, uh, if anyone has any. Um, so yeah, we got about seven minutes. Or does everyone just want to go start drinking? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I understand you have uh, guaranteed that only one month of, or sorry, a month can only be in one room because of supply chain shortages. Yeah. Uh, you don't have that with a graph database, how do you deal with that? So as long as we can use the machine, why should we use it? So yeah, so the question was is uh, you've got referential integrity uh, in uh, a, a relational database, and uh, that keeps you from putting a monster, say, in two rooms. And how do you keep that from happening in graph? And the answer is you don't. <laughs> a graph doesn't provide that. Uh, that is something you'll have to do in your code. So uh, graph doesn't know the schema. You could put. Uh, you could. You could say a room contains a room. You could say a monster is contain is in multiple rooms. You could totally do that. Uh, now semantically, that doesn't make any sense. But the graph doesn't care. You, you can connect anything to anything. Yes, sir. Uh, are you related to Santa Claus? <laughs> um, no, actually, I'm not. But uh, my father is Bigfoot. <laughs> I haven't seen him in years. He's hard to find. Yeah. He went out one day for milk and cigarettes and never came back. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I don't, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I can't imagine that the, the question was, is, is querying against the edges versus the nodes more performant one way or the other? I don't think there's a big difference. Um, 
There's probably some algorithms where this matters, uh, some of the built-in algorithms, like the shortest path algorithm, you can, you can use weights on the edges. If you tried doing that another way, you wouldn't have access to that algorithm. So there's certain things that kind of just it works that way. Um, I don't, wouldn't imagine there'd be a huge difference, but I don't know. I find, in general, I tend to, if I, lots of times if I find myself wanting to put properties on my edges, that means I actually have a node that I didn't realize I had. So like I tried modeling a, uh, whoever, who all uh, ever played MUDs, the multi-user dungeons, text-based things? Uh, yeah, okay, you're all over 40. Uh, <laughs> um, in there, um, I, I tried building one of those using Redis Graph as a backend because it was a very natural metaphor, right? And it would be fun for this talk. And what I ended up uh, doing was I created connections between the rooms to be the corridors, and I quickly realized that the, the, the edges were actually door nodes, and then the doors were in rooms and connected to other rooms because I had a bunch of properties that were on those. And so uh, that's, the, that's just my sort of back of the envelope experience. And so I, I think if you find that what you're asking is I, I want to load up my edges with data, you probably have nodes that you don't know you have. But that's just sort of armchair architecting. Any other questions? I, I see one back there. Yeah, so you have the room with the precise node. Uh, yeah. The question is what the database and the service will have to start with the cloud and keep the, uh, traveling through the same loop over and over again? That's a great question. So he asked, he, he noticed that I had a, a node that connected back to itself. And um, when you query that, will it go forever? <laughs> Can you create an endless loop in a query? Because there certainly are. If you go path to path, what are all the paths through some of these graphs? Well, sometimes they're infinite. It will stop. Uh, the, the graph detects those. I, I, I don't know how it does it internally, but it does do that. It, it, it won't uh, run forever. So great question. I, I meant to bring that up in my talk, and I forgot. So thank you for filling in my gaps. So I'll another hand up there, right there, and then there's one back there. Yeah, so the question is, how's the scaling? Graph databases are pretty memory heavy. Um, it's actually pretty good. Um, Redis has some limitations because the graph is stored in a key. Uh, the graphs are limited to about 195 megabytes for a single key. If you are doing a lot of modifications, because it's in a single key, um, you can't scale it horizontally because Redis has to have that key in a particular shard and it lives there. Now, if you need to read, and you're just, you're, you're, if you get a read-heavy graph, which I think is often the case, um, then you can replicate that key to other nodes, to other shards, and then you can scale that out very nicely horizontally. Um, as far as just performance internally, they can be memory hungry. Uh, there's, there's two ways in memory to represent a graph. I, I don't have a slide for it. I almost, I almost put the slide in, but I didn't. Uh, one way is that you can have a bunch of linked lists. And so a linked list has a node, and then it's all the nodes it has relationships to it are in that linked list. And then you got a linked list for each node in the graph. That's nice and compact. It does, it's memory efficient. But it's a lot of O of N operations across lists. Right? Linked lists, you've got you to walk the list. The other way that you can store a graph in memory is you can use a matrix. And that matrix then is all the nodes and all the nodes. And then there's a number representing a particular uh, type of edge between those two nodes. And then you've got a, it, it, takes a, it has a space complexity of, of O of N squared. That's the problem with that approach. Uh, it, you know, if you've got a, a million nodes and you've got a million by million matrix, that's big. And that's where it starts to blow up memory. Uh, Redis actually kind of splits the difference, and we use a library called Graph Blast. And so it uses uh, sparse matrici matrices to store that, which basically means it doesn't store the zeros. And then uh, it's, it's a very performant API against those sorts of matrices. And then all your queries are just linear algebra problems. And so uh, it actually performs very good at scale. Uh, the bigger limitation is just you can only shove so much into an individual key in Redis. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I saw another question back there. How would you choose between a relational graph database? How would I choose between a relational graph database? So if I was doing real work, I would probably choose to use a relational database until I, I, I couldn't, um, <laughs> honestly. Um, the uh, graph database, uh, well, I'm, uh, clearly the only answer is Redis. <laughs> but um, the, the thing that's really the differentiator for a graph database, I mean, it's, it's, it actually is a good metaphor for the kinds of problems you would want to solve, but the thing that really differentiates it is the pathing queries. 
So if I've got nodes and I want to do, solve pathing problems between things, uh, that it, that's really its, its superpower. Uh, so for social graphs, it's great because it lets you find friends of friends uh, and find intersections of those structures. Uh, for net transportation stuff, it lets you find paths through a transportation grid. But there's lots of things that are pathing problems that you need to solve. So that's where it shines. And so if I had those sorts of problems, I would be looking at graph databases. If I didn't have those sorts of problems, I'd probably use something a little simpler. Um, I, I would use Redis. <laughs> yes? Uh, what's the licensing on Redis Stack? Uh, Redis Stack is under the Redis Source Available License, which is a, uh, I'm going to say it's a very generous license. It basically says you can use it all you want, and if you want to manage the infrastructure yourself, you don't have to pay us a dime, uh, unless you're going to resell it as like a competitive product. So you, you can't take Redis Graph as a module, put it on Redis and say, hi, uh, we're releasing this new graph product. <laughs> 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 yeah, if you want to do that, you'll have to pay us some money. Right? <laughs> uh, but otherwise, if you're like, you know, like if you're an auto manufacturer and you want to use a graph database for some reason, and you want to use Redis Graph, and you want to manage the infrastructure yourself, have fun. It's perfectly fine. Any other questions? I think, I don't know if I have till 40 or 50. I think, I, I think I'm done, ain't I? I've lost track. Yeah, we're done. We're, we're, we're a minute over, so. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>